Sarkoris was the name of the ancient Kelid kingdom that could be found between the realm of the Mammoth Lords and the Ayabarian nation of Mendev. However, during the death of prophecy, a great rent in reality cut through the nation, creating a portal directly into the Abyss, the home dimension of the demonic legions. From that day onwards, Sarkoris was destroyed, and in its place was the World Wound, or the Sarkoris Scar. I'm going to cover only a much narrower regional history in this video, as in my two previous Avistan videos, I covered the Realm of the Mammoth Lords, which covers a fairly comprehensive history of the Kelid people, and a Northeast Avistan video, which gives a thorough accounting of the history of nearby Mendev, so I recommend starting with those two videos before heading into this one. Sarkoris, of course, has its own history, however, so I want to rewind the clock before the death of prophecy and take a moment to look in more detail at old Sarkoris and the events that brought us to today. The History of Sarkoris and the World Wound In my Mammoth Lords video, I noted that at some point during the Age of Darkness, there was a great ethnic Kelid split between the Yurktiri and the Sarkorian Kelids. What I didn't mention is that despite the destruction of Old Sarkoris, what little archaeological evidence there is suggests that the very first Kelid people originated near Sarkoris. In fact, the first evidence of their people can be found on the western shores of the Lake of Mists and Veils. Moving inland from the Great Lake and settling upon the plains of Sarkora, these tribes encountered a domain abundant with elk and deer for hunting and wolves to be tamed. In this ancient world, upon the towering north mounds, the Sarkorian Kelids dared to challenge the might of the tyrannical frost giants, and delving into the depths of the Forest of Stones, they realized that even they were not the first humans to call this rugged land their home. In the midst of an ancient forest, aged beyond comprehension, the druids belonging to the Circle of Hierophants forged harmony with the wonders and ferocity of the natural world. Were those druids Aslanti or Thessalonian exiles? Possibly. We may never know as their history is poorly documented, and the world wound means little evidence of that time still exists. Likely the Hierophant Druids intermarried with the Kelids, their bloodline being lost to time. These ancients had chronicled the voices of the untamed wilderness, bringing connections to other realms and eternally marking the passage of time. Under the guidance of the Druids, the tribes of the plains of Sarkora thrived, venerating the earth, the seasons, the land's creatures, and the beings that held dominion over each aspect. They erected towering monoliths as symbols of their devotion to these deities and performed blood sacrifices, their stories and visions influenced by the teachings of the druids who walked among them. As the tribes expanded, many migrated to neighboring lands, shaping their own destinies in realms that would later be recognized as the realms of the Mammoth Lords, Numeria, Ustalav, the River Kingdoms, and even further reaching southern lands. Within the shadow of the North Mounds, these nomadic tribes gradually formed solidified clans and state claims to territories, establishing villages and clan holds that became uniquely their own. This unforgiving yet revered land became known as Sarkoris to the plains inhabitants, and it was around the time these first villages were established, and that Sarkoris acquired its name, that the first ethnic Kelid split occurred. Throughout the ages of anguish and destiny, Sarkoris was a realm encompassing diverse tribes, bound together by their pride, shared cultural practices, and communal religious beliefs, rather than a singular ruler. Through centuries of conflicts, conquests, alliances, and intermarriages, the tribes of Sarkoris gradually evolved into numerous clans. As the years passed, the traditional chieftains gave way to family patrons, and the title of clan liege emerged to signify the position of a leader of a clan. Within Sarkorian society, the concept of family, honor, and loyalty to one's kin held a prominent position with entire clans willing to take up arms in order to avenge any perceived slight against their members. This emphasis on family is reflected in Sarkorian names, which typically incorporate a family name, representing the specific branch of the clan to which an individual belongs, followed by the clan name. The only exception to this naming convention is observed among the direct family of a clan liege, who bear only the name of the clan itself. For example, the name Ineris Dismar Staghart signifies that Ineris is of the Dismar family, which is a vassal family of the Staghart clan, while Clan Liege Gald Staghart signifies the chieftain of the entire extended Staghart clan. 
Occasionally a clan may allow an outsider to join its ranks, either by adopting an esteemed ally or by taking in the children of a conquered adversary as charges. In the final days of Sarkoris, there were 24 clans that held lands across the region, with as many as a dozen families sworn to each clan. The Sarkorian clans of renown were All River, Bale Moon, Black Earth, Bloodstone, Cleft Horn, Ever Hearth, Ever Leaves, Found Last, High Bow, Howling Blood, Ice Lodge, Laurel Shield, Mead Bow, Never Home, Never Run, River Soar, Stag Heart, Star Eye, Storm Heart, Tamer, Widow Knife, Wind Step, Winter Sun, and Young Bow. In the midst of this tapestry of relationships, the Druids continued to hold much awe and respect, imparting the secrets of nature and the realms beyond to an astonished populace. Alongside their faith in divine powers, Sarkorians embraced the teachings of Druidic magic, sorcery, and the veneration of godlike entities summoned from distant realms, as well as the enigmatic practice of witchcraft. The people of Sarkoris developed an inclination to perceive the divine essence within all facets of existence, extending their worship far beyond the domain of just conventional divinities. In his scathing chronicle titled The Witch Cults of Northern Avistan, the intrepid Ustalavi explorer and devout follower of Erastil, Broman Shai, meticulously chronicled and condemned the diverse folk religions prevalent in Sarkoris before the death of prophecy. He derisively referred to Sarkoris's vast pantheon of deities and divinities as the Hundred Hungry Gods. However, this sensationalized title proved to be misleading on two fronts. First, it grossly underestimated the actual number of entities encompassed within Sarkorian religious beliefs. Secondly, it simplistically categorized these diverse beings as gods, disregarding the multifaceted nature of worship in Sarkoris. In truth, the Druids of Sarkoris embraced a comprehensive perspective on their existence within the multiverse. They regarded planar anomalies, such as portals, as inherently natural occurrences, with the potential for great destruction, akin to the devastating impact of natural disasters. Furthermore, they saw beings from other planes, such as archons or clipoths, as no different from fae, elementals, or even animals. In the eyes of the Sarkorian druid, the spirits dwelling within the plains held an equal reverence to the powers inherent in the land itself. Those individuals endowed with the ability to connect with and channel these forces, such as oracles, summoners, and witches, were revered among the region's druids as conduits of religious power and esteemed leaders of the faith. They served as fonts of divine energy for the locals, like clerics in other cultures, seen as capable of tapping into and manifesting the spiritual forces that permeated Sarkoris. Now it's also true that many of these beings held true divine status, their immense power and influence making them practical choices for worship. Deities such as Desna, Gorum, Gosre, Lamashtu, and Phrasma enjoyed particular prominence among the Sarkorian populace. However, it was not uncommon for each region and settlement to have its own set of divine patrons. Communities would erect circles of intricately carved meniers, each dedicated to members of the local pantheon. For instance, the villagers of the largely Sarkorian settlement of Raliscrad considered themselves followers of both Druidic traditions and servants of Phrasma, whose influence in antiquity extended all along the southern Sarkora River. Additionally, alongside Phrasma, they held deep reverence for the imperial lord Pulura and the demon lord Kochchi as dualistic forces representing the cold. They even worshipped a planetar angel named Desuriel, a figure who had not attained even the status of a lesser divinity simply for his legendary role in saving a young village boy from drowning. Despite the collective worship in the society of all these planar figures, each area's established clergy would naturally gravitate towards a single deity, witch patron, or occult sponsor, because that's how divine or occult power typically works on Galarian. However, to the lay worshipper in the community, when a child fell ill, it was the combined power of the entire pantheon that healed her. And when wolves attacked a shepherd's flock, it was believed to be a result of displeasure from one of the adversarial members of the pantheon. Thus, despite their inclination to appease and revere various otherworldly forces, the people of Sarkoris regarded their patrons as integral components of their regional identities, sources of solemn honor, and beings as mighty, if not mightier, than any single deity in the southern lands. Just as communities embraced patron divinities, the Sarkorian clans did as well. 
Clans represented linked families, and in areas where a single clan held dominance, the community's patron and the clan's patron were often one and the same. However, often clans and communities formed a matrix structure, with communities being comprised of multiple clans and clans being spread across multiple communities. Each family belonging to an extended clan structure was expected to contribute to the clan's faith by dedicating their third son or first daughter as an acolyte to the religious leader of their cairnhold. These leaders, known by various titles such as druid, priest, witch priest, or god caller, depending on their abilities and local traditions, exemplified the diverse religious practices within Sarkoris. Two famous examples of Sarkorian clans and their divine patrons include the Stagheart clan, who were sponsored by Oglenweiss and the Stag Mother of the Forest of Stones the godcallers of the Neverhome clan, whose summoners called forth the dawn-feathered offspring of Stura Venon, the renowned dragon eagle. Many widespread Sarkorian deities had animalistic features. Perhaps they were powerful fey forms, or lesser agathians, or even stranger entities. Today we may never know, as few depictions of these entities remain in the world. Examples of these gods include such strange entities as Dowanu, a god depicted as a dozen-legged giant ferret. Isonu, the feathered moose with flowered antlers. Funalu, an elk god with a torso and head of a great owl. Gossiak, the woolly white rhino with horns cresting on its back. Kagia, the two-headed vulture bear. Luwaka, the gold mammoth god who was frequently depicted sprouting fire from three trunks. As well as the boar god Idovik, whose back was covered with jutting bone spurs and whose witch priests were all granted powers of necromancy. This extended polytheism was the common state of affairs in Sarkoris for thousands of years, with various clan lords jockeying for power in a realm that was not truly unified, except by tradition and cultural heritage. That would change, however, in 3672, when a great Kelid king rallied dozens of clans behind him, with the aim of finally wiping out the frost giant strongholds in the North Mounds that had continued to raid the Kelid lands since the earliest days of Kelid settlement in the region. Fresh from his victory, he established a capital city at the central Kelid village of Iz, a place that had been known for its stone masonry, metalworking, and mining. Other significant settlements to be established in this time included Indarin, established in 4012, where herders from western Sarkoris would bring their flocks to market, and Dying Light, established in 4256, renowned for its impressive cairn ring dedicated to Pulura, Mistress of the Stars. Such was the power and influence of this first great king that all Kelid clan chiefs bent the knee to him, all except the shaman kings of the village of Sterasta along the West Selen, which remained independent for another 300 years. Sterasta had a unique history in the region, because not only did the shaman kings remain independent, but about 150 years after the rest of Sarkoris was unified, they permitted southern settlers into the city. There came to Sterasta in 3845 a Talden veteran of the Shining Crusade, the great war with the resurrected Lich King Tarbafon of Ustalav. As Captain Stormont was approaching retirement, he bargained with the shaman kings to trade him the rights to a small island in the middle of the Selen River in return for bringing engineers in from Lastwall to help construct walls and bridges. As a result of these additional fortifications, when the world wound did finally open up, the city of Storasta was the very last to fall, a fortified bastion that held out longer than any other Kelid city. However, those walls were not enough to hold back the demons nor were they enough to keep them independent of Sarkoris forever. Despite Storasta's vast walls built by southern engineers, in the year 4000, the Sarkorian warlord Ulrich Zirgas arrived at the head of an army with allied witch wardens from Iz, Undarin, and Dying Light, who challenged and overthrew the shaman rulers of Storasta. In truth, their conquest of Storasta was only successful because Storasta itself was in the midst of a difficult civil strife. Rifts had divided it since Talden settlers had come to Stormont Isle, dividing the city between traditionalists and those who had begun to crave the convenience of southern modernity. The shaman kings resisted these so-called Southlander influences, proclaiming that Storasta should remain the wild and pure spiritual heart of the Northlands. By the time Ulrich's army reached the city, Sarkorian nationalist elements within the city had opened the gates for them, ending 300 years of independence for the booming southern Sarkorian city. By 4406, something had subtly shifted in the religious practices of the Kelids of the North Mounds. 
After the defeat of the Frost Giants, the Kellids had cleared out the giant stone Jarl holds of the Giants and moved in there. In that time, the apex of the High Cairns, the tallest peaks of the North Mounds, were dominated by an imposing structure known as the Threshold Citadel. This massive fortress tower, constructed with slave labour by the frost giant Jarls of old, reached towards the heavens, a symbol of their one-time power and dominance over the region. Within its formidable walls, the various religious leaders of Sarkoris's clans convened to deal with individuals who posed a threat to their cherished beliefs, yet whose skill or knowledge made them too valuable to be permanently silenced. Perhaps it was the lingering power of frost giant shamans in the air. Perhaps it was the profane energy that came with so much mass bloodshed that was spilled when the Kelid slew all the giants there. Or perhaps it was because the Sarkorians had chosen to imprison so many heretics in that citadel, but it was here that the cult of Descari took root among the Sarkorians. Of course, because of the myriad other deities, demigods, and nature spirits venerated throughout the land, as Descari's influence spread from the threshold, only a few individuals discerned its divergence from other local faiths. After all, the Sarkorians had many, many gods, and not all of them were kindly entities. The secluded nature of their communities shielded most Sarkorians from realizing how quickly the worship of the Lord of Locusts was spreading across the region, as he demanded sacrifices from villages across Sarkoris, their collective prayers and rituals unknowingly fueling the Demon Lord's burgeoning power. Although it might have escaped local Sarkorian attention, it did not escape divine attention. By this time, the god Aridan had been an ascended deity for almost 4,000 years, and from his divine domain in the Plain of Axis, he monitored the world for dangerous extraplanar threats. In 4433, the god Aridan came to Galarian from the heavens, the first such time he had done so in over a millennia. He came to Sarkoris and shared his warnings with the people, and only then did the peril become widely acknowledged. Accompanied by a coalition of valiant clan lieges and their armies, Aridan marched across the Ayabarian nation of Mendev to camp outside the Mendevian city of Egede. It was in fact here, not in Sarkoris itself, on the banks of the Lake of Mists and Veils, that Discari was focusing all the power he had summoned to him from the Sarkorian dark rituals and sacrifices. Wading out of the lake came a titanic avatar of Descari, a colossal insectile entity surrounded by a vast cloud of a billion choking flies. Aridan fought with Descari's avatar directly, as the Sarkorian clan lieges and the Ayabarian militia from the small but growing port of Egede fought with the lesser demons that followed in the avatar's wake. The battle was ended when Aridan broke Descari's avatar, drowned it in the Lake of Mists and Veils, and then atomized it with his divine power. Although this was celebrated as a great victory for the Sarkorians, with Aridin's eventual departure after the victory, the fragile unity among the clans crumbled. Although the cult of Discari was temporarily suppressed, as we will see, it was not entirely eradicated. For another 150 years, the cult of Discari remained quiet, but the North Mounds would continue to be a source of trouble for the Sarkorians. In 4600, there was a prison break and rebellion held at the threshold, with the bound heretics turning on their Sarkorian overseers. The details of the rebellion remain unclear, but what has been discerned is that it began with three influential prisoners that galvanized others to their cause, the defiant godcaller Opon, the cunning witch Arilu Vorlesh, and the wizard scholar Wiver Nochlin. In the course of their escape, the spellcasters ruptured the fabric of reality. A haunting voice whispered through, promising them assistance. Too late did they realize that the voice belonged to the demon lord Descari, whose attention had long been drawn to the North Mounds since imprisoned humans had first felt his influence almost 200 years earlier. When the trio's great escape plan was set into motion, and numerous portals materialized within the confines of the threshold, instead of leading to various realms as originally intended, each portal forged a direct connection between Sarkoris and Discari's abyssal domain known as the Rasping Rifts. Filled with horror, Opon and Wiver desperately and heroically attempted to reverse their magic. They were in fact on the verge of sealing all the portals when Vorlash betrayed them casting both mages into the final closing portal and wedging it open slightly, preventing its complete closure. The great escape failed, of course, and the wardens of the Threshold Citadel sealed Vorlash accidentally into the very cell that contained the pinprick breach. Though the breach was too small for anything to pass through, Discari's whispers came through loud and clear. 
Over the next six years, from her prison cell, Vorlesh became Descari's preeminent disciple in Galarian, listening to his whispers and meditating on his power. Through her relentless nurturing, the portal she had wedged open grew from a mere pinprick to a sizable tear, not large enough for a fully grown person, perhaps, but large enough for a house cat or a small-sized fiend to crawl through. Still, by making clever use of shape-shifting magic, Vorlesh was able to slowly assemble an army of demons through the breach, and in 4602 she emerged from her prison cell and launched a devastating assault on the threshold. Vorlesh and her minions mercilessly slaughtered her captors and converted numerous prisoners into devoted cultists of Discari. By 4605, her influence had expanded to encompass a significant portion of the High Cairns, and although she was considered a growing regional threat, the Sarkorians did not mobilize effectively against her. Everything changed in 4606 with the death of Aradin and the ensuing chaos that engulfed Galarian. Seizing this opportunity, a resurgent Descari forcefully flung open the portal. The once trickling demonic energies transformed into a relentless onslaught, overwhelming the scattered clans and reclusive druids of Sarkoris. Those who dared to resist perished in the face of the demonic onslaught. Those who sought refuge in the lands of the Mammoth Lords, or Ustalav, found little solace, meeting their demise in the unforgiving wilderness of the realm, unless they happened across a mammoth following willing to take them in, or being shot down by Ustalav's paranoid crossbowmen who held the border secure from the Shutterwood to the Greatmere Swamp. The emergence of the world wound obliterated Sarkoris's capital city of Iz. It also devastated the land, causing rivers to run dry and the earth to fracture. Mercifully, in conjunction with this devastation, a series of supernatural tempests known as the Plague Storms impeded the demons' advance beyond the borders of north-central Sarkoris. This respite allowed the rest of the nation to regroup and fortify defences along the Rift Shadow, although in times these lands too would fall, with the great walled city of Storasta being the last settlement of the Sarkorians to be conquered. However, these storms also gave neighbouring Mendev much-needed time to reinforce its sparsely protected border and to call for aid from its southern neighbours. The first to answer the call were the knights from Lastwall, who had long held vigil over the tomb of the Whispering Tyrant. The arrival of crusaders faithful to Iomede and other religions from the south temporarily contained the demonic army. The knights of Lastwall were soon followed by crusaders from Andoran, Isgur, and Cheliax. Note that the Chelish Revolution was still ongoing, and House Thrun would not emerge as the dominant power in that part of the world for another thirty years. Most of these crusaders were former Ardenites, who had begun to worship Iomede or various other good deities in the wake of their patron's demise. This set the stage for the era of the Mendevian Crusades. The first crusade is generally considered to have lasted from 4622 to 4630. In the first crusade, with the combined strength and organization of the crusaders and their newfound allies, the demonic forces were gradually pushed back towards the North Mounds. Mendev and the Sarkorian lowlands were liberated, and the crusaders offered assistance in fortifying defenses against future attacks. Although the proud and historically independent Kelid tribes of Sarkoris initially resisted, the Church of Iomede officially ended the First Mendevian Crusade in 4630, after strengthening the defenses and confining the demonic threats to the North Mounds. While some crusaders returned home, many remained in Mendev to continue defending the nation against future demonic incursions. In reality, the initial demonic invasion served as a testing ground for Discari, allowing him to assess the strength and tactics of his opponents. The brutality and disorganization of the early attacks were deliberately orchestrated to reinforce the perception among the Crusaders that their enemies were a chaotic horde, driven solely by destruction and rage. In 4638, the demons launched a counterattack, led by the powerful Marilith Zura Aponovisius, triggering the Second Crusade. They captured the crusader city of Dresden and inflicted heavy casualties upon the Mendevian forces and pilgrims. The Second Crusade was initiated to confront this new menace, but the generals quickly realized that they were now facing coordinated groups of fiends led by powerful demonic generals. The crusaders fought valiantly, but eventually realized that completely reclaiming Sarkorian land was no longer feasible. Instead, they focused on containment and erected the Ward Stones, massive monoliths that created nearly impenetrable barriers for the demons to cross. These they situated along the West Salon and Mutre rivers. This halted the demonic advance at the borders of Mendev, Ustalav, and Numeria, saving countless lives. The Second Mendevian Crusade officially concluded in 4645, with the Ward Stones considered a significant accomplishment. After the establishment of the Ward Stones, there was a brief respite from demonic attacks. 
The demons in that time focused on consolidating their power and dealing with threats from the realm of the Mammoth Lords. However, when they did resume their assault southwards and eastwards, it triggered the Third Crusade, which lasted from 4665 to 4668. This time, the demons employed more covert methods of infiltration, aided by cultists of the demon lord Baphomet, who had infiltrated crusader organizations. This all occurred as the Mendevian crusaders faced a shortage of skilled recruits and began accepting warriors with dubious intentions. As corruption spread within their ranks, the Third Crusade devolved into paranoid witch hunts, ruthlessly targeting any suspected demonic influence. In 4692, a powerful Baelor named Karamzade, the Storm King, emerged as the leader of the demons. He managed to damage the Wardstone in Kenebres and breach the frontier, but he was eventually driven back after a fierce battle with the dragon Terendelev. Concerned about the Storm King's potential to unite more demons under his banner, the Fourth Crusade was launched to defeat him. Lasting 15 years, this was the longest and most grueling of the Crusades to date. It concluded in 4707, with a demonic retreat, leaving the exhausted crusaders unable to capitalize on their victory. The Fourth Crusade also witnessed the emergence of the Order of Heralds, a knightly order tasked with curbing the excessive purges and inquisitions that characterized the Third Crusade. The story of the Fifth Mendevian Crusade is played out in the Wrath of the Righteous Adventure Path and Computer Role-Playing Game, and it was triggered by a demonic assault on the city of Kenebres. Despite the city's defenses being swiftly overwhelmed and its wardstone destroyed, a small group of defenders unwittingly gained the wardstone's powers. They rallied Queen Galfrey's forces and led their armies directly into the world wound. It was this fifth and final crusade that finally sealed the rift in the world, cutting off the demons from entering the world wound. This brings us to today. The region that was once known as the world wound has now become known as the Sarkoris Scar named after the jagged and disfigured blackened rock that stretches across the land where the abyssal rift once existed. With the closure of the interdimensional tear and the defeat of the demon lord Descari, the scattered descendants of Sarkoris dare to envision reclaiming their ancestral land. However, the task before them is daunting. Despite Descari's demise and the dispersion of his demonic forces, the northern land still harbors threats. While the sealing of the world wound cut off the endless stream of demon reinforcements, it did not eliminate the fiends already present or cleanse the blight that taints the landscape. Most of the strength of the Mendevian Crusade has been redirected to confront Tarbafon in the south, leaving the remaining Holy Crusaders fewer in number and less watchful than before. The demon-infested ruins of Storasta, Underin, and Iz were initially reclaimed, but the daunting task of rebuilding on such corrupted sites led the victors to raise and abandon them instead. Nevertheless, a small yet valiant coalition of crusaders and descendants of old Sarkoris remain determined to restore what they can. Their only real permanent stronghold is the fortified town of Gundrun, which has been transformed into a walled and protected fortress with abundant supplies. However, these self-proclaimed reclaimers prefer a nomadic lifestyle. Part of this stems from old Khaled beliefs that a wanderer's way is purer and nobler than a settled one. Yet in truth, the reclaimers also favor nomadism because the Sarkoris scar remains too perilous to establish permanent settlements. Until more of the region can be purified, any large-scale encampment beyond Gundran would be considered profoundly unwise. Instead of rebuilding cities, the reclaimers concentrate their efforts on restoring the blighted wilds. Two of their main objectives are the city of Dying Light and the ancient Druidic repositories hidden deep within the corrupted Shutterwood. Unfortunately, both sites remain under the control of corruption. Dying Light is surrounded by clans of fiendish and cannibalistic giants, while the native fey of the Shutterwood have been twisted into tormented and perverted forms, not to mention the presence of the Moonscream clan of werewolves discussed in my Mammoth Lords video. Even the wild animals that roam these lands bear the lingering touch of the abyss, evident in their glowing eyes and uncontrollable bloodlust. Yet despite the slow and arduous progress, the reclaimers persist. Safety within the Sarkora Scar is yet to be found, but for the first time in a long while, hope has rekindled. The Geography of the Sarkora Scar Most geographers divide the Sarkora Scar into five main regions. The largest portion of the Scar is known as the Wounded Lands. This is the region from the Mendevian border in the east to the Sarkora River in the west and comprises the bulk of Sarkoris. It is also the region that contains the scar itself. At the very center of this region is the ruins of the citadel called Threshold, where the rift was first opened as described in my history section. Just northeast of this tower can be found the ruins of Iz, the capital city of old Sarkoris. North of the wounded lands are the Stonewilds. 
Before the opening of the World Wound, the Stone Wilds were a vast evergreen forest called the Forest of Stones, sacred to the Green Faith, and where the Stag Mother was first worshipped. Stretching from the Stone Wilds in the east to the Wolf Crag Mountains in the west is a northwestern region of Sarkoris known today as Frostmire. Composed mostly of inhospitable marshes and ragged hills, Frostmire was sparsely populated even before the demons arrived. The one notable settlement was Dying Light, located on the northern reaches of the Sarkora River. Speaking of the Sarkora River, south of the Frostmire Fen, the length of the Sarkora defines another region, now commonly known as the Rift Shadow. Before the opening of the World Wound, the Sarkora River was a heavily travelled main trade route through the realm of Sarkoris. The formerly heavily travelled waterway passed by the cities of Storasta, Raliscrad, and Underin, along with dozens of smaller towns and villages. Finally, along the eastern border with the realm of the Mammoth Lords lies the region known as the Sarkorian Steppe. Since the closing of the World Wound, this region has become the most richly populated by the Reclaimers, with Gudrun acting as the de facto capital for the region. Let's take a closer look at these regions in more detail, moving from west to east. The Sarkorian Steppe. The Sarkorian Steppe stretches across the western region known as the World Wound, spanning from the Mutre River in the south to the Wolf Crags in the north. Apart from the Shutterwood and a few scattered ruins, there is little to break the monotonous landscape in these barren steppes, except for the bleached bones of ancient megafauna, a vast barren tundra not unlike the northern steppes of the Mammoth Lords. Historically, the Sarkorian steppe had always been sparsely inhabited by humanoids. Instead, its vast expanses, like in the lands of its western neighbor, were home to enormous herds of mammoths, woolly rhinos, elk, and other magnificent beasts. Naturally, the Mammoth Lords have long considered the Sarkorian steppe to be an extension of their hunting grounds, though historically Sarkorian trappers, hunters, and herders have made use of the region, building settlements like Domora and Silvershore to mark the boundaries of their claimed lands. Those two locations in particular I discuss in more detail in my Mammoth Lords deep dive video. Conflicts between the Sarkorians and the Mammoth Lords over the precise borders separating their territories had been frequent with territorial boundaries shifting based on the outcome of their battles. The transition from Sarkorian-ruled lands to those ruled by the Mammoth Lords had always been gradual, creating a realm that combined stretches of untamed Yurktiri wilderness with frontier villages populated by Sarkorian trappers and hunters. Throughout the Crusades, this remained mostly the same, albeit with horrific demons replacing the relatively benign Sarkorian inhabitants. Consequently, the Mammoth Lords who contested these lands had to become even more hardened and formidable. Many of the Mammoth Lords' greatest warriors could be found herding in these border provinces, occasionally leading raiding parties directly into the World Wound, with the same ferocity and recklessness of the Eastern and Southern Crusaders. With the close of the World Wound, these lands have fallen ever more under the sway of the Mammoth Lords, although the Sarkorian reclaimers have begun to assert their foothold too, starting with the establishment of their capital city of Gundrun. Important locations in the Sarkorian steppe. Gundrun. In the aftermath of the World Wound's opening, a multitude of refugees fled their homes. Over the course of months and years, thousands embarked on a journey along the Silverscale River, their aim to seek refuge in Ustalav to the south. Among their stops, they inevitably passed through the modest town of Gundrun, inundating the small fishing village that had long been the clan hold of the Sarkorian Riversore clan. As the influx of displaced Sarkorians continued, the situation worsened, exacerbated by the Ustalavic soldiers stationed at the border whose vicious crossbows turned back the tide of desperate refugees. Hundreds turned back from Ustalav and returned to Gundrun, defeated and despairing. Looting began, and with the murder of clan liege Bulras Riversore on the streets in 4612, anarchy ensued. Even the land turned against the people, as the taint in the earth caused crops to sicken and the silver scale to gradually dry up. The village became a nightmarish hellhole, without a single demon ever setting foot there. Thereafter, Gundrun existed as a ghost town for a while, left abandoned and ravaged by scavengers and raiders for many decades. However, in 4667, members of the Clefthorn clan of Sarkorians who had survived by retreating into Mendev set their sights on reclaiming Gundrun and the nearby Riversore clan hold. Their intention was to establish a strategic base from which they could launch attacks against the demons, seeking to restore the lost honor of Sarkoris. Unfortunately, this endeavor proved to be a catastrophic failure. Within a span of three years, the returning Sarkorians were forced to retreat due to demonic assaults on the town, and the Riversore clan hold was burned to the ground. 
Nevertheless, the cleft horns were stubborn, and they returned a few years later and built their own clan hold lodge in the centre of town and refortified the walls. Among their number was a young warrior named Martol's Clefthorn, who is still alive and remains the elderly clan liege of the city. In the fifty years since they secured the village, clan liege Martol's has seen a dramatic transformation, not just in the town, but in the spirits of the Sarkorians themselves. Attracted by the Clefthorn banner, numerous Kelled families, wanderers, traders, and sellswords cautiously made their way back to Gundrun. They constructed makeshift homes, along with stables, trading posts, forges, and even a few scattered farms. In doing so, they resurrected the town as a rough-knit community, situated somewhere between a military encampment, a refugee camp, and a barter town. For the descendants of Sarkoris, this town holds a sense that a part of their nation has survived, along with the flickering hope that just maybe the Sarkoris of old might one day be restored. Today, Gundren has expanded beyond a refugee camp, it has become the most prominent Sarkorian settlement in the entire region, boasting a population of over 2,000 individuals. It is effectively now the de facto capital of the Sarkorian steppe and the cultural center for all surviving Sarkorians. The following prominent locations make up the town of Gundren. The Cleft Horn Lodge. A far cry from the majestic clan holds of ancient Sarkoris, this structure stands as a crude wooden fort that serves as the gathering point for the troops of the Cleft Horn clan and as the residence of its eldest members. In the town of Gundren, only a handful of individuals, fewer than ten, can claim true Clefthorn lineage. Primarily, these are the sons and daughters of the venerable clan liege Martol's Clefthorn, who played a role in the successful reclamation of Gundren in his youth. Martol's has shown he is willing to adopt nearly any skilled warrior into his clan, an honour that carries the weighty responsibility of patrolling and defending Gundren. The River Soar Clan Hold this was once the formidable fortress of the Riversor clan, but it met a devastating fate mere months after being reclaimed by the Clefthorn clan during their first attempt to take back the city. There are conflicting accounts regarding the destruction of the keep. Some attribute it to the vengeful wrath of the demons, while others suggest that a member of the Clefthorn clan betrayed his own kin. Regardless of the truth, the remnants of the clan hold now lies in ruins, situated outside the town on a hill that offers a commanding view of the runnels tracing the former path of the Silverscale River. Since the closure of the World Wound, the citizens have finally cleared it of dangers and are in the process of rebuilding the old clan hold, but the work is not yet complete, and Clan Liege Martols continues to govern from the Clefthorn Lodge. The Walk of Lost Gods Not far from the Riversore clan hold is a circle of towering, weather-beaten standing stone many years. These stones serve as enduring remnants of the ancient deities worshipped in old Gundren. Among them are monuments to Gorim, Gosre, Pulura, Torag, Urgathoa, and Vard Rockgrinder, a local hill deity. As refugees traversed through and settlers returned to Gundren, they brought their own gods and beliefs with them. Now, among the ancient monoliths, over a hundred carved logs, metal markers, and etched stones lean, serving as poignant memorials to the countless deities once revered in Sarkoris. The Splinter Although more drinking establishments have opened up since the World Wound's closure, the Splinter remains Gundren's most popular watering hole, exuding a boisterous atmosphere in the centre of town. One-armed Walt, the proprietor and barkeep, proudly boasts of his ability to pour drinks and consume them with unmatched prowess. Despite losing his arm while battling demons during one of the numerous sieges of Dresden, Walt humorously insists that he can still outpour any other barkeep in Sarkoris. The tavern derives its name from the prominently displayed remnants of Walt's shield, which was bitten in half by the same demon that claimed his arm. The Brins Farmstead A direct descendant of the Brins family, vassals to clan Widowknife, Allais Brins Widowknife practices the Sarkorian art of godcalling, summoning and commanding a creature her family once viewed as a deity. Although she doesn't truly know whether it has divine blood, she knows her Edelon Tonbars, a great wolf-like creature with a pelt that glistens like a nightful of stars, as a lifelong companion and friend. Alaise has long harbored a greater objective than growing old in Gundren. She hopes one day to reclaim the Widowknife clan hold in the ruins of Underin. Although Gundren is the largest settlement in the Sarkorian steppe, it's not the only one. Just east of the Greatmere Swamp, along the wet banks of the West Selen, but under the shadow of the Gundren Rise, is Fort Clearwater. This small wooden fort was another vital crusader waystation along the Selen, and has for a long time been the home of the alchemist Elida Zvin and a beleaguered band of crusaders from the Order of the Solar Lantern. 
While Alida earned great acclaim and the Crusader's allegiance by using her powers against the demons, her fascination with demonic physiology drove her to extremes, and in the final days of the Fifth Crusade, merchants who had made the terrifying supply run out to the fort whispered that her dedication to ending the demonic menace had led her to begin conducting obscene experiments on her own people. However, Alida was betrayed by those she trusted before the end and wound up dead. With the Crusades ended, the structure of Fort Clearwater is likely still in use, most probably occupied by Sarkorian reclaimers, but who knows what secrets the alchemist who once lived there had buried in the fort. In addition to the two small settlements in the Sarkorian steppe, it is also the location of a few natural geographic features. The Forest of Embers When a cabal of cultists of Flauros, the demon lord of fire, and their army of Brimorax raised the forest of soldiers and set it aflame, offering up the immolated refugees as burnt offerings to their terrible master, the forest was renamed the Forest of Embers. With the closing of the world wound, reclaimer druids are working hard to bring life back to the forest, but it's a difficult challenge. Deep within this scorched woodland, there still lies a place of great power, revered by those who worship fire or yearn to harness its might. Here, Brimorax, corrupted fire elementals, salamanders, and cultists of Flauros still gather, and the reclaimers do not yet have the strength to stamp out their corrupting fire. The Bride's Pool Fen The once beautiful lake known as the Bride's Pool fell victim to the devastating influence of the world wound. Unlike other lakes in the steppe, a remnant of moisture remains here, transforming the once clear waters into a putrid and stagnant bog. This forsaken swamp has become a breeding ground for perilous corrupted plant forms, repulsive gibberleth demons, and menacing hazeru demons. The region was heavily afflicted by the demon plague, leading some to believe that the infamous disease originated here, and that a potential cure may be hidden within its depths. The Tribes of the Steppes Along the Sarkorian steppes, the most successful survivors of the demonic incursions were those that lived in the steppes and kept on the move living in the same manner as their Yurtiri cousins, the Mammoth Lords. These nomadic tribes assisted during the Crusades by periodically raiding the demon-controlled lands along the Sarkora River, or even further in. One particular tribe stands out among the rest, the Hornbreakers. Led by the weathered barbarian Krygor Halfface, a fierce and seasoned warrior, they established a reputation for their many successful raids. Unlike other raiding parties, the Hornbreakers had a unique approach. Their entire tribe is mounted, either on horses or woolly rhinos or mammoths, but instead of venturing inland, they always rode along the northern and southern borders, traversing the length of the region. Their primary objective was always to locate and eradicate demonic incursions, and to provide aid to other raiding parties that found themselves outnumbered and outmatched. This strategic choice not only enhanced the Hornbreakers' renown, but also contributed to stabilizing the western boundary. Though the world wound is closed, the demons are not yet all defeated, so the Hornbreakers keep to their customs. The sight of the Hornbreakers galloping into Gundrun after months patrolling the steppes is a sight to behold. Adorned with horn trophies, torn from the skulls and bodies of slain demons, their armor and mounts serve as vivid reminders of their prowess. The thunderous roar that erupts from their Sarkorian supporters upon their arrival speaks volumes of their esteemed reputation and the fear they instill in their enemies. Frostmire. Frostmire had always been a remote and sparsely populated region, even during Sarkoris's prosperous era. Its unfortunate geography subjected Frostmire to the brunt of bone-chilling winds that swept across the desolate northern tundra. Consequently, it had earned the reputation as the coldest territory within Sarkoris. Presently, Frostmire primarily consists of rugged, desolate hills and the expansive icy waters of the Frostmire Fen, rendering it an inhospitable place for human settlement. When Sarkoris fell, an eerie transformation occurred in the northern lights that often graced the realm's night skies. A haunting image of a weeping woman's face emerged. In Frostmire, priests devoted to the imperial lord Pulura received additional visions, foretelling a tidal wave of demonic terror engulfing their land. Thanks to Pulura's warnings and the demon's focus on more densely populated areas, the people of Frostmire enjoyed the relative luxury of several weeks to evacuate their homes. By the time the demons redirected their attention to the now deserted region, they found little to satisfy their malevolent desires, only vacant villages and forsaken dwellings. Their priorities shifted towards the more populated southern and eastern regions, while the growing momentum of the Crusades and the amassed forces at the border of the world wound kept them preoccupied. 
Since the demons largely abandoned the region to focus their attention on the war in the south, presently Frostmire stands as the least infested by demons among the five regions of the former Sarkoris kingdom. Nevertheless, it is far from a sanctuary of safety, and the reclaimers have made no headway in taking back this land, even though many would like to retake the city of Dying Light. Important locations in Frostmire. The ruined city of Dying Light. In its prime, this, the largest settlement of the Frostmire region, housed several thousand inhabitants, primarily trappers, hunters, and individuals who supported these industries. The size of Dying Light reflects its past population. While the city's former citizens held diverse religious beliefs, they held a prominent reverence for the imperial lord Pulura. Their faith centered around a grand circle of idols, honoring Pulura as the mistress of stars, and the enigmatic light of the aurora. Its people abandoned the city long before the demons came, thanks to warnings from their patron goddess. To this day, Dying Light remains abandoned by humanity, although technically not uninhabited. While few demons remain this far into Frostmire, occasional encounters with fiends still occur. However, the true masters of Dying Light are the Marsh Giants, led by the sadistic high priest Glungur the Mighty. Glungur, a cleric of Kotschi, takes pleasure in scouring the surrounding lands for the dwindling number of humans, whom he delights in feasting upon. The Frostmire Fen Stretching across a vast expanse, Frostmire Fen encompasses chilling marshlands interlaced with sulfurous hot springs. These fens present all the perils familiar to swamp dwellers from more southern regions, but the near-freezing temperatures introduce additional hazards such as ice, snow, and the risk of hypothermia. Travel through this area is further complicated by the profusion of treacherous plants and fungi that infest the region. Prior to the fall of Sarkoris, much of the Fen's ecosystem relied on the abundance of hot springs that peppered the area. These springs, which prevent the majority of the water from freezing, served as vital sources of life-sustaining heat. Surrounding these springs, dense ground cover and flourishing plant life provided sustenance for the local animal population. However, in the present day, this plant and animal life has taken on a demonic nature, making it harder, more resilient, but also much more likely to rip apart and devour any intruders. Shadow Spring Located at the northernmost edge of the Frostmire Fen, Shadow Spring is a small settlement located around the largest sulfur hot spring in the region. This expansive sinkhole became the home for a small community of stubborn evacuees from Dying Light. Led by the Tarnshav family, one of Dying Light's wealthier households, these settlers hoped to find safety in this new settlement. However, the passage of time, generations of inbreeding in the isolated community, and the increasing influence of abyssal forces have taken their toll. The inhabitants of Shadow Spring have started to lose their sanity. While they derive most of their sustenance from diseased creatures from the wolf crags, the people of Shadow Spring, in order to ensure their survival, also began engaging in cannibalistic practices, both among themselves when a member of their community died of natural causes, or when they captured prisoners, such as lost crusaders or wandering barbarians. The Shroud of Unicorns Burnt trunks and ash remain as haunted remnants of the once proud forest known as the Shroud of Unicorns. This forest was once home to the largest herd of unicorns in all of Galarian. The surviving members of this majestic herd valiantly battled the invading demons from the depths of the forest, where a few tenacious trees still stand. Within the ruins of the forest, two mythic unicorns have survived the horror of the last hundred years, Alun Elsheus and Kaidenenlo, and they now lead what remains of their blessing. The Wolf Crags. These rugged foothills lie in the northeastern region of the Tusk Mountains, and acquired their name due to the once abundant population of direwolves that inhabited the labyrinthine valleys. However, all the direwolves have perished and risen as undead beasts, now emitting rasping, gurgling howls to a moon they can no longer see. While the wolf crags derive their names from these creatures, they are not the sole peril present in the foothills. Giants, especially stone, frost, and tiger giants from the Tusk Mountains and the Crown of the World, had long plagued the area, and although most giants moved away during the demonic threat, they have started to return since the World Wound's closure. Rift Shadow A colossal plateau that was once known as the North Mounds, but now is referred to as the Wounded Lands, has long been separated from the western steppes by a wide, winding river called the Sarkora. In the prosperous era of Old Sarkoris, this river served as a vital trade route. It used to be the most densely populated region in the nation, adorned with thriving cities like Starasta, Raliskrad, and Underin, as well as numerous smaller towns and villages. However, today this area has transformed into a nightmarish landscape of ruins and abyssal horrors. 
demonic creatures seep down from the northeastern plateau or lurk along the river's depths. Important locations in Rift Shadow. Valahoov. Not unlike Shadow Spring in the Frostmire region, the walled town of Valahoov represents one of the few Sarkorian villages that defied the odds by resisting the encroaching demons. This fortified keep served as a refuge for around 300 Sarkorians. The mighty Balemoon clan hold stands today as the most intact ancient structure of its kind, an extraordinary stronghold nestled within its inner courtyards, the inhabitants of which, the Balemoon clan, along with those under their protection, assert to outsiders that their deity Tameri, manifested through the Edelon of their esteemed chieftain, godcaller Fainro Balemoon, was the power that safeguarded them. However, the truth behind their resilience is that something much more potent and considerably darker has been extending its protection over them. The deity that the people of Valahuv call Tameri is in fact not an Edelon at all, but a Sanguidemon of Abaddon. This story begins many centuries ago, when the Sanguidemon Omors entered the material world accidentally and roamed across the Sarkorian steppe, leaving behind a trail of bloodshed and lifeless bodies in several villages. However, amidst its ruthless killing spree, Omors developed a curious fascination with the Sarkorian religious beliefs and their profound reverence for divinity encompassing all aspects of existence beyond mortality. Seizing upon this belief system, Omors cunningly presented itself as a divine entity to the people of Valahuv, offering protection in exchange for sacrifices. Astonishingly, the humans swiftly embraced the Sanguidemon as a revered deity within their local pantheon, much to Omors' delight. When the demons of the Abyss poured forth from the world wound, the sectarian nature of evil was made quite clear. Although the Abaddonian Sanguidemon was certainly an evil creature, it had no allegiance to the demons of the Abyss, and it did not wish to have its little fiefdom trifled with. Consequently, Omors, or the goddess Tameri, as she prefers now, protected the village of Valahuv and has survived the sealing of the world wound, continuing to be worshipped as the living god of Valahuv. If other Sarkorians know the truth of this, they have kept quiet. So few Sarkorian villages remain that few would openly condemn the Balemoon clan for their grim choices. Undarin. In the days before the World Wound unleashed its demonic hordes, Undarin stood as the bustling mercantile hub of the Sarkora River Valley. It welcomed herdsmen from the western regions who brought their livestock for trade and slaughter while miners and skilled stonecrafters from Iz and other settlements atop the North Mounds relied on the Undarin Lift to access the plateau above. However, with the cataclysmic emergence of the World Wound, Undarin's fate took a dark turn. It was the nefarious demon witch Arilu Vorlesh who orchestrated the attacks on Undarin during the First and Second Crusades, marking her final direct involvement in significant warfare. Arilu claimed Undarin as her personal domain, making it her headquarters, during the period of her demonic reign, Undarin maintained an illusion of vitality, appearing as a thriving city. However, this facade masked a grim reality, as Undarin's citizens were magically enthralled subjects under the command of various demons, especially Incubi and Succubi, only feeling the full brunt of the cosmic horror they were living through in their rare moments of lucidity, suddenly aware that their lives and sanity hung but by a thread. Nestled on the cliffs commanding a view over the city of Undarin and the meandering river stood the ancestral clan hold of the clan Widowknife, who once commanded the city. After the sacking of Undarin, Arilu claimed the clan hold as her own. Within the depths of the Widowknife clan hold, where her dark dungeons and secret laboratories intertwined, Arilu completed her ritual of transformation into a succubus, a dark apotheosis that led her to finally abandon her humanity. During the Fifth Crusade, Undarin was conquered by Crusaders, but the depravity of that city was too great for the Crusaders to consider holding it, so they set the city ablaze and watched it burn from afar. Today, demonic entities have returned to the charred ruins of Undarin, seeking Arilu's many hidden secrets. Sarkorian eyes also turned to Undarin once again. As though the city was put to the flame, it was an important settlement once and many wish for the old Widowknife clan hold to raise its banner over the old city once again. The Needle Glens The Needle Glen stood as an ancient forest even when Sir Chorus was young. After the world wound, the Needle Glens remained one of the few woodlands untouched by the ravages of fire and complete annihilation. Curiously, it seemed that the demon horde held an affinity for the dense, thorny undergrowth and the contorted trees that adorned the forest, allowing it to remain relatively intact. 
While much of the surrounding region succumbed to blight and extinction, the Needle Glens endured, expanding its reach along the winding river. However, this resilience came at a price. As the forest flourished, it became increasingly receptive to the insidious influence of the abyss. The unique and deadly life forms that inhabit the Needle Glens, both plant and animal, have undergone a twisted transformation, marked forever by the taint of the abyss. Galcor's Tower during the First Crusade, a cleric of Ayamade named Galcor built a tower along the Sarkora River to house a powerful weapon. Unfortunately, demons overwhelmed Galcor and his assistants before they could arm and trigger the weapon, but complex failsafe sealed off Galcor's tower and kept the device from falling into abyssal hands. During the Fifth Mandevian Crusade, Galcor's secret weapon was reacquired by members of the Pathfinder Society in the Society adventure titled Weapon in the Rift. Raliscrad Nestled at the confluence of the Sarkora and Isk rivers, the desolate remnants of Raliscrad hardly bear testament to its former glory, as a thriving settlement along one of Sarkoris's busiest trade routes. As the world wound emerged, the town was abandoned, leaving behind a trove of riches and architectural marvels. Of particular note was the Temple of Ivyfane, a large structure consecrated to a unique Sarkorian blend of the Green Faith and the worship of Phrasma. While Raliscrad suffered greatly during the demonic incursions, its sturdy stone structures managed to withstand the initial demonic assaults, and for this reason, the formidable Lilitu named Minago chose this location to establish her own local demonic fiefdom. With meticulous care, Minago restored and altered the Ivy Fane Temple to align with her vile ideals, incorporating her own twisted symbolism into its architecture. Under her rule, Raliscrad continued to harbor a significant population of humanoids, all of whom became slaves, thralls, or lackeys under the rule of Minago. However, her rule was not absolute in Raliscrad. Ancient Kelid kings were buried beneath Raliscrad in tombs located deep beneath the earth. For whatever reason, these ancient dead were considered important enough by Phrasma herself to cause her direct intervention as powerful psychopomps were sent to the material world in these deep barrows to protect them from access by Minago and her servants. The leader of these psychopomps was a Marigna psychopomp named Atsum Sira, who ensured the ancient Kelid king's rest went undisturbed. During the events of the Wrath of the Righteous, Minago was defeated by adventurers. The fate of Raliscrad is not specified in the Lost Omens world book, but since it was not named as one of the cities explicitly raised by the Crusaders during the Last Crusade, like Underin, Sturasta, and Is, it's reasonable to assume that Raliscrad, like Dying Light, is high on the list of settlements the Sarkorian reclaimers will seek to re-establish once they have the manpower to do so. The fact that Atsum Sira is likely still safekeeping the dead here, and that Minago, for all her malignancy, did restore much of the city, makes this all the more likely. Storasta Storasta was a unique Sarkorian city, ruled over by shaman kings who remained independent of the rest of the country for centuries after its unification. They even invited southern architects to help them build walls and bridges, and this made Storasta one of the greatest and largest Sarkorian cities even after they were subsumed into the Greater Kingdom. During the demonic incursions, this was the very last city to fall. Even after the fall of Storasta, this great city never became a demonic holdfast, because its close proximity to the wardstones placed at strategic points along the West Selen meant that it was an unpleasant place for the demons to remain in. Instead, they abandoned the city, but in their absence, tainted sentient plants and darkling fey, vitalized by the lingering spirits of Storasta's last defenders, but warped by the world wound's emanations, wound up occupying most of the city. A mad treant named Carrick ruled over much of the city in the last hundred years, ruling from the keep of Carrick's how at the city's heart. He cultivated an entire grove of fiendish treants and corrupted leshies, as well as enlisting a network of evil dryads and other corrupted nymphs, which in turn kept harems of enslaved satyrs and werewolves to serve and fight at their pleasure. A coven of green hags also made their home in the city, and a hazer demon willing to defy the pain of the wardstones claimed the keep at Stormont Isle. After the world wound was sealed, but before the majority of the Crusaders had begun to depart for other purposes, an alliance was brought together to cleanse the city of Starasta from the corrupted treants and evil fey. These Crusaders were successful, but after their victory they deemed the corruption of Starasta to have been too great, so they doused the entire city in pitch and set it ablaze, hoping to burn out whatever corruption remained. Although it was raised, Starasta was a great city once, and its greatest structures were built of solid stone, and would have survived the Great Blaze, so it's possible that in time the Sarkorians will come to reclaim this ancient city. 
The Stone Wilds. The Stone Wilds were once an immense woodland known as the Forest of Stones, the evergreen trees of which shielded much of Sarkoris from the crown of the world's frigid winds. Formerly a Druidic stronghold, the vast majority of this forest has been burned and the charred husks of its trees have petrified to stone. Little remains of the numerous stone meniers the Druids used to mark their sacred sites, and even less manages to live within this scoured landscape unless it hails from the abyss or survives as an undead abomination. As recounted in my history section, the first Druids to settle in the Forest of Stones predated even the coming of the Kelids themselves. These ancient animists and nature worshippers were already so venerable and powerful when the Kelids entered their lands that they had a firm hand in shaping the beliefs and customs of the settling Kelids. The secret Druidic language was first spoken here. The Green Faith, by all accounts, was born in this forest, and while this ideology has long since spread throughout the Inner Sea region and beyond, its first and greatest philosophers learned to command the forces of the natural world here, in this remote region of the far north. Once the demon incursions had begun, the demons found that the presence of so many druids made conquering the Forest of Stones a formidable challenge. Within the Forest of Stones, the demons encountered a united front of like-minded and powerful spellcasters. Unlike the Crusaders in the east and in the south, or the Mammoth Lords in the west, the druids were not formed of disparate groupings with conflicting beliefs. They were a cohesive force, defending not only their homeland, but also the very essence and origin of their entire ethos and philosophy. The Druids had purposefully chosen the Forest of Stones as their stronghold, recognizing the abundance of sites brimming with potent natural magic and energies. These sacred locations not only granted the Druids their substantive powers, but also served as a wellspring of inspiration for the Green Faith itself. During the first demonic incursion, countless demons perished in their relentless attempts to overrun and annihilate the Forest of Stones. Discari, realizing he had underestimated the power of the Druids, decided during the First and Second Crusades to focus his armies on other regions further south. However, he had no intention of leaving the Forest of Stones untouched, and by the Third Crusade he enlisted a specialist to help him conquer the forest. He enlisted the aid of a powerful Vrolikai, or death demon, named Shorhaz. Shorhaz was not just a regular death demon, but a servant of Sith Visag, a demon lord who had originally been a Klipoth lord once, and was one of the most ancient and terrible demigods residing in the Abyss. Sith Visag was a demigod devoted to the corruption and destruction of nature and the natural world. His disciple and servant, the death demon Shorhaz, eagerly accepted the task and led his own demonic army through the world wound portal to confront the druids. Shorhaz began by surrounding the forest with his forces, systematically destroying the sacred stones closest to the forest's edges. Though countless demons fell in the process, the strategy proved effective. Unable to defend against the relentless assault from all directions, the druids gradually weakened with each shattered megalith and every tree reduced to ashes. The pragmatic druids eventually realized their chances of victory were slim. However, they still had one final option to prevent the complete annihilation of their homeland. The surviving great circle of druids, led by their hierophant Osmazar, engaged in a desperate and sacrificial act, absorbing the enemy's corruption into their own souls. Using this stolen power against the demons themselves, they unleashed a monumental surge of sacred fire that reduced much of Shorhaz's army to ashes. The immense wave of corrupt power, however, didn't just damn the druids. It also unfortunately transformed the remaining flora of the forest into petrified stone. As for the druids themselves, their flesh was blasted, their bones turned to stone, and they rose as the Siabre, the undead guardians of the Forest of Stone. Although the world wound has been sealed, and the demons of the stone wilds have been pushed back, the stone wilds no longer belong to the living these days. The Siabre druids have embraced undeath, bolstered with the strength of the wounded but still living world beneath their feet. They fought not only against demonic trespassers into their realm, but against all living creatures, for they are filled with bitterness and hatred for their brethren. The green faith was meant to die, the Siabres believe, for the truth and glory of the Stonewilds to emerge. Important locations in the Stonewilds. The Circle of the Hierophants. Of all the locations in the world, none can hold as significant a place in the traditions of the Druids of the green faith. This is the oldest and most ancient Druidic holy site, and here, over long ages, the Druids have carefully inscribed their secrets and knowledge in a secret language upon the faces of the towering meniers. 
These symbols held specific information that could only be fully understood within the greater context of the surrounding natural features. The lore contained within a single carving extended beyond itself, intricately connected with the carvings on other many years, creating a record of lore about the natural world as deep and intricate as any to be found in any of the great libraries of the world. Therefore, the Circle of Hierophants stood for millennia as the most revered and expansive collection of Druidic knowledge in the world, once serving as the focal point of the Green Faith's philosophical teachings. In the past, these caves were tended by the Hierophants, the leaders of the Green Faith. However, the Siabres, the undead guardians of the forest, have claimed the circle as their domains now. They still consider the protection of this site to be their sacred charge, but these corrupted druid wraiths have been so perverted that they twist the ancient teachings of the circle, continuing to transform the stone forest around them with their corrupting influence. The Goddess's Tear Located at the western edge of the stone wild, the Goddess's Tear was once a serene lake with pleasant wooded islands at its centre. These islands served as the home of druids who had not yet earned the privilege to join their brethren within the circle or at the spiral hill mount. To this day, the debris-filled remnants of their homes remain hidden among the stone trees. A few of the Siabre can be found here too, so it's possible that powerful druidic magic lies concealed within these structures, guarded forever by their new undead masters. Greengrave Keep As the demon warlord Shore has failed to seize control of the Circle of Hierophants, the most revered site in the Stone Wilds, he resorted to establishing his fortress of Greengrave Keep upon what he deemed the next holiest location. This imposing fortress is perched upon a colossal artificial hill with a distinctive flat-topped pinwheel spiral shape. Known as the Spiral Hill, Druids constructed this mound countless millennia ago as a grand focal point for ritualistic magic. During the summer and winter solstices, a procession of Druidic hierophants would traverse a path defined by stone circles which marked the hidden ley lines discernible only to them. Their journey culminated atop Spiral Hill, where they engaged in day-long ceremonial rites to initiate new druids into the esteemed ranks of the faith. Made from uprooted standing stones, this blasphemous fortress is the largest built structure in the stone wilds. Following the closure of the world wound, it is not known what happened to Shorhaz, but it is unlikely that he and his minions remained at Greengrave Keep, because that would have placed them between the Crusaders at Dresden and the vengeful Siabre at the Circle, with no forthcoming reinforcements. It is more likely the undead have claimed Greengrave Keep these days, though at this point that is pure speculation. The Lake Lost to the Sun Even before the arrival of demons, the Lake Lost to the Sun had a grim reputation. This expansive body of water, characterized by its stillness and darkness, was rumored to harbor aggressive and unusually intelligent sea serpents. The lake's dark waters appear nearly black, even under the brightest sunlight, and possess the uncanny ability to reflect an overcast sky regardless of the weather. The druids of the Green Faith avoided this foreboding lake, fearing that disturbing the ancient and primordial nature spirits dwelling within would result in their fierce defense of those murky depths. To this day, even the demons rarely ventured into this area, and the mysterious and age-old source of the darkness that lies at the lake's bottom remains an unsolved mystery. The Wounded Lands among the five regions of this desolate realm, the Wounded Land stands as the epitome of tragedy, danger, and death. It is within these forsaken lands that Arilu Vorlesh, in collaboration with Discari, played a pivotal role in tearing open the world wound. The aftermath of their actions birthed a twisting labyrinth of canyons and chasms, adorned with a multitude of interwoven portals that inflicted unparalleled devastation upon the once proud Kelid kingdom of Sarkorus. While the world wound rarely stretches wider than a mile, its depths plunge thousands of feet into seemingly unfathomable chasms, obliterating vast expanses of the upper Darkland realms of Narvalth. Before the original rent was sealed back up again, in certain places, especially on ominous nights, the world wound would reveal its true nature, with rifts into the abyss unfurling within its seemingly bottomless depths. For a hundred years, the heart of the abyssal corruption beat within the wounded lands, and here nothing adhered to the natural order. When light managed to pierce through the gaps in the oppressive black clouds above, the sun, stars, and moon appeared as if from another reality, disconnected from the world. Some days the sun would rise in the west and set in the east, or at night the stars and moon would manifest oddly, too scarce, too abundant, or simply wrong. It is widely believed that the skies above the wounded lands were not Galarian's own as long as the rift was opened, but rather a reflection of the horrors that lurked beneath the world wound, an eerie mirror image in the firmament above. 
Now that the fissure has been sealed, some sense of normalcy has returned to this region, but only in the broadest strokes. Here, at the heart of the corruption, legions of demons still control vast stretches of territory, pockets of corruption still warp the land and people, and the enemies of all free people still plot to reconnect the Sarkoris scar with the malignance of the abyss. Important locations in the wounded lands. The ruins of Is. The once grand capital city of Sarkoris stood as the Kelid Kingdom's only true metropolis. Its expansive lodges and towering structures occupied by the most affluent and influential Kelid families. And here the clan lieges from across the kingdom would come together to hold council. However, the world wound devoured much of the city, and only a fraction of the original city survived even the initial rending of the land. The once vibrant Aurora River, which used to grace the city, was turned into a desolate and demon-infested drybed. Among the remnants of Is, only three of the original five great gates survived the collapse, alongside a section of the city once known as the Throne District. It was here in the Throne District, at the Crystal Citadel, the former seat of power of Old Sarkoris, that Karamzadeh the Storm King reigned after his emergence from the World Wound during the Fourth Crusade. During the Fifth Crusade, Is was taken by Crusaders, but its corruption was deemed too great to be recuperable. The Crystal Citadel was brought crashing down, and the entire city was put to fire. Dresden. A small army of dwarven crusaders constructed Dresden during the First Crusade, to serve as the crusaders' deepest and most well-fortified redoubt. Through their relentless efforts, they constructed a war-hardened city with a massive citadel, firmly establishing a foothold in the heart of chaos. They forged it in the likeness of the ancient sky citadels, and that it largely survived sacking by the demonic hordes is a testament to the resilience of dwarven engineering. Despite its formidable defenses, Dresden could not withstand the relentless onslaught of demons that emerged from the world wound between the First and Second Crusades. In 4638, the citadel and the city fell under the control of Discari's forces. However, in the course of the Wrath of the Righteous Adventure Path, the city of Dresden is retaken by Crusaders, and Dresden serves as a critical location throughout the rest of that adventure path. Although Dresden is not directly addressed in the Lost Omens World Guide, I can't imagine that Dresden would have been abandoned given its highly defensible position and its strong walls. I am guessing that since Dresden was a Crusader city, and since Gundran is named as the largest reclaimed Sarkorian city in the World Guide, that Dresden has since instead been made a part of the nation of Mendev, extending its borders somewhat west of the Selen. The Threshold Citadel The Threshold, a tower prison perched atop the highest point of the High Cairns, once served to secure confinement for the most powerful arcane spellcasters of Sarkoris. Under the watchful eyes of the nation's religious leaders, these spellcasters were kept under strict control to prevent their heretical views from altering the Sarkorian culture and heritage. Ironically, it was within the walls of the Threshold Citadel that the seeds of the World Wound's devastation were sown, sparked by the desperate escape attempt of three prisoners. Now the tower prison of the Threshold stands as a haunting monument at the epicenter of Sarkoris's malevolent scars. The Hanging Tower Situated on the fringe of the North Mound Plateau is a floating structure overlooking Frostmire and the Stone Wilds. Its peculiar form takes the shape of an inverted obelisk, crafted from dark red marble, hovering with an unsettling stability several inches above the Earth's surface. This extraordinary defiance of gravity suggests an otherworldly origin beyond mortal comprehension. Its enigmatic appearance and unfamiliar construction leaves scholars and observers alike perplexed. While some speculate that it is another unimaginable spawn of the abyss, the tower's relatively recent emergence at the turn of the 47th century raises doubts about its connection to the opening of the world wound. The true source and purpose of this extraordinary structure remain shrouded in mystery, inviting further exploration and investigation. During the Crusades, the tower came to be in the possession of a mercurial glabrisu named Irakendra and a small army of demons, but whether that is still the case or not is currently unknown. The Temple at Pulura Falls Not all the bastions of Old Sarkoris succumb to the ravages of the world wound. Against all odds, one such stronghold endured, deep within the treacherous wounded lands, weathering over a century of relentless siege without the protection of wardstones or the aid of crusaders. Once located at the site of a magnificent cascading waterfall, now reduced to barren cliffs, a sprawling temple complex dedicated to the imperial lord Pelura is one such structure. The main section of the temple, located above the falls near the former lakeshore, is connected to a second structure at the base of the cliffs through passages and stairwells carved into the rock. 
In the days of old, this river and its lakes served as burial grounds for the nobles of Iz. Funeral barges were blessed by priests and used to carry the honored deceased where they reached Palura's Falls, set aflame, and were guided over the falls. Today the dry lake bed below is strewn with bones, offerings, and the remnants of the burned ships. The protective wards that safeguarded the temple during the long century of demonic occupation owed their continued functioning and reinforcements to High Priestess Eliandra, the most powerful Kelid cleric of Palura still alive on Galarian. Over the past century, Eliandra continued to grow in strength, her lifespan extended by the same magic that safeguarded the temple. However, she understood that the weight of the past century would crush her in an instant, should the temple fall or if she should venture beyond its protective walls. The trapped priests maintained an unwavering belief that Palura had a purpose for them, and eagerly awaited the day when the shimmering maiden revealed her divine plans. Again, although not directly addressed in the second edition sources, we can surmise that the Sarkorian clerics of Palura Falls have reconnected with the Crusaders, and that the Palura Falls Temple has re-emerged as a safe harbor for humans in the Sarkora Scar. Lake Epona by sheer luck, Lake Epona managed to retain its form as a body of water amidst the encroaching, grasping tendrils of the world wound. The waters of the lake, however, did not escape corruption. Its once pure waters now teem with foul and toxic fluids. The lake's edges ripple and churn with an eerie, almost sentient eagerness, as if the entire body of water possesses a twisting semblance of life. The creatures residing within the waters of Lake Epona are horrific maneuvering through the contaminated liquid and sustaining themselves from it when living flesh and warm blood are not readily available as their preferred nourishment. The Winged Wood The Winged Wood once stretched from the old Sarkorian marshlands to the West Selen River, though now it comprises little more than a wasteland of ash and perhaps twenty square miles of tortured, perpetually smoldering trees. At the forest centre, an old fiendish green dragon named Azrivaxis roosted atop an ever-growing hoard of treasure, plundered from the ruins of surrounding villages and scavenged from the rotting corpses of demons and crusaders alike. Azrivaxis shared his domain with a companion, the succubus Zelmistria. Sightings of a succubus riding a demonic dragon diminished the morale of crusader troops unlucky enough to encounter the pair whenever they conducted one of their frequent raids along the West Selen. Though the succubus and the dragon had long been the most dangerous denizens of the winged wood, they were not the only threats, as the winged wood was also home to corrupted dryads known as the Burning Daughters, perpetually smouldering creatures that emerged from equally perpetually burning host trees.